Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and also with Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. In the last video, I talked about uh, this paper, Decadal Changes in Radiative Fluxes at Land and Ocean Surfaces and Their Relevance for Global Warming. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information uh, in this paper that allows one to tease out the effects of uh, climate change effects from um, increasing greenhouse gas levels, which are radiative effects, and from aerosol effects, which block some of the shortwave radiation, um, can either reflect it back to space, causing cooling of the, uh, cause, causing uh, no increase of temperature rise in the atmosphere, or if there's lots of black carbon in those aerosols, absorbing that energy heating the atmosphere, increasing the downward thermal radiation that's causing the uh, climate change or global warming. But there's also, um, there's also a huge indirect uh, component of clouds. So this paper tries to tease out some of that. So I talked about some of those issues previously. I'm gonna, I'm gonna revisit it. So I just wanted to talk about some of the highlights in this paper, um, which I may have glossed over before. So basically, um, this, is, uh, this is Potsdam, Germany. Um, this is a, we don't have a lot of long-term, really long-term solar radiation uh, measurements. So we need photo sensors on the surface pointed upwards to detect incoming sunlight. So there's good records in Potsdam from the late 30s, and we saw an increase in the sunlight reaching the surface. Then we saw this decrease, this dimming period, um, up until the early 80s, and then we saw an increase um, in sunlight. So there's a de uh, uh, there, there, this is not due to changes in the sunlight. The changes here are an order of magnitude larger, so there's, there, there are changes in actual it's also not, so it's not due, the sunlight at the top of the atmosphere is the same. What it has to do with is the optical transmission of sunlight or shortwave radiation through the atmosphere, reaching the detectors on the ground. So aerosols, um, there's, a, so aer there's less aerosols, more sunlight coming through, then there's more aerosols, um, less sunlight coming through, and then less aerosols, more sunlight coming through. Um, or, now, it's not just the aerosols, it's also the clouds that are generated from the aerosols that are up there. So, um, uh, the key points of this paper are, uh, first of all, the diurnal or daily temperature range over the northern hemisphere land. Uh, when we look at these periods that are defined um, around the world, I showed the example of Potsdam, but they're being seen around the world at uh, various sites. There's a lot of regional data taken, so this paper is a review paper. It looks at data coming from all the different regions, and there's basically an early brightening period, a dimming period, and a subsequent brightening period, uh, which we're in. So um, basically, the daily temperature range, if um, in this case was increasing when there was brightening, so when there's brightening, when the transmission of light through the atmosphere is uh, increased with less aerosols, then the daily temperatures can be larger um, about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. You know, the, uh, during the day, the ground's been heating all day. The sun is stronger because there's less blocking, aerosols blocking it. So you get da higher uh, daily, you get higher uh, mean temperatures but you also get colder um, night temperatures because the shortwave radiation, there's no sunlight at night, it's dark, so the shortwave radiation emitted up through a, a transparent atmosphere, more, gets, more heat is lost, the temperature can be colder at night, so the temperature range is increasing. Now you put in the aerosols, less sunlight gets to the ground during the day, so the daily maximums are not as warm, and more heat is trapped at night, so the daily lows are warmer, so the temperature range decreases during the dimming period, which we expect and is also exhibited 
during, uh, we saw the changes from 9-11 uh, with no planes flying and the contrail different. And then again, you get the brightening here, similar to what's happening there. Okay, so this is over Northern Hemisphere land, but there's also some very interesting features here. Uh, going back to uh, the, um, okay, so where were we? Yeah, no, I, wanna, I do wanna go back down here. Um, very, most of the measurements are done over land, but we're, we're starting to get, we have since the 80s, we have satellite measurements, which are a global view. We have, also have ocean buoy measurements, light detectors on the ocean buoys to measure uh, down short wave and long wave radiation coming down. And we see, uh, we can see some differences uh, between the two regions. So let's have a look at, uh, okay, so first of all, um, this is looking at downward thermal or long wave radiation. So this is an effect of building up greenhouse gases. They absorb the short wave radiation. Um, they, they, they absorb, sorry, the, the short wave radiation heats up the earth, producing long wave radiation. That long wave radiation comes up, it's absorbed in the greenhouse gases, re-emitted back to the surface. So the down wave thermal radiation is increasing um, from greenhouse gases. So, you know, it's increasing about two watts per square meter per decade globally as a consequence of anthropogenic releases of greenhouse gases. Okay, this is the rate of increase at the energy surface due to the enhanced greenhouse effect causing the global warming. Okay, so we get a nice trend here. Um, now, let's go on and let's look at the temperature rises at the surface in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. Okay, in the southern hemisphere, the air is a lot cleaner. There's a lot less sources of, of, of aerosols, whether they be sulfates or black carbon or any other gunk coming from industrial civilization going up. So there's a lot more pristine air over the oceans, a lot less industry. So we see this trend, upward rise in trend and in temperature and this 0.07 degrees Celsius per decade, 0.09 per decade, um, very consistent over the whole period. This is what we would expect in an aerosol-free uh, planet. So if we had no industry in the Northern Hemisphere, we'd expect this type of temperature range um, from the increase in, in uh, greenhouse gases, okay? Take out the aerosol effects. Now in the Northern Hemisphere, there was a large increase in aerosols in this time period, which caused the global dimming. Um, so the aerosols caused a cooling, which exceeded the warming from the increase in greenhouse gases. So we had a drop of temperature here. And these aerosols, there was large sulfur being emitted, which reflects energy back up to space. Um, so the atmosphere wasn't warming. There was also um, the sulfur component was swamping out the black carbon component. Black carbon in the atmosphere also blocks sunlight causing the global dimming, but it was absorbing the shortwave radiation causing um, the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, well, the, the, it's still in the troposphere, but a couple kilometers higher, however high the black carbon went, um, and uh, caused heating of the atmosphere, and, and it dimmed light at the surface, but it was still causing global warming. Um, so we see this sharp variation, um, sharp, sharp shift here. So the rate of rise is much larger um, after the sulfur is, is greatly reduced and the, the, uh, there's an actual drop here. So, so this, is the this is the industrial, um, industrial uh, civilization processes which dominate, um, which really modulate the greenhouse gas effect in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, whereas in the Southern Hemisphere, um, we, we see this effect. So, so the idea that temperature will skyrocket without industrial civilization um, doesn't hold water because the temperature would more go to this scheme and rise like this in the Southern Hemisphere. So the idea of temperature would jump four degrees or half a degree, um, you know, it could go something like half a degree. It really depends on all of these complex interactions, um, but we would go to this sort of 
thing. It would go much to a much, so the rate of climb here, a lot of the increased rate of climb here is due to the um, reduction of, aeros of, of aerosol, specifically uh, sulfur dioxide, and uh, also increases in black carbon um, would cause this from, from uh, poor uh, combustion techniques to, for people, to, you know, three, three billion people heating food and just burning dung and things like that. Lots of black carbon ex ex exacerbates the temperature rise in the northern hemisphere there. Um, this is really interesting. Um, we do, the aerosols do go out to the sea. So if you put aerosols from pollution in a pristine environment, then they cause a very strong um, global dimming signal over the ocean. As these are decreased, then we could see a rise here. Um, this is northern hemisphere sea only. This is land only. So over the land, there's a lot of the, the uh, aerosol effects that block the light dominate over, over the cloud interaction effects, the indirect effect one, which is um, smaller particles in the clouds, brighter clouds, and, in, and, and cloud indirect effect two, which is longer lifetime of clouds. Those are kind of dominate, those are kind of washed out over the land more by the direct, uh, you know, less light coming to the surface. So we see a, a, a rise here and a rise and at a very steep rise here over the over the northern hemisphere land. So the land is, uh, you know, the thermal heat capacity of the land is much lower than that of water. So everything's sort of muted over the water, much stronger over the land. So you know, in conclusion, so I want to talk about these conclusions here. So the radiative energy drives a lot of these, drives these processes. So any change has the potential to alter the state of Earth's climate and environment. From the greenhouse gases, we expect a gradual increase in downward thermal radiation causing the heating. And we see this two watts per square meter per decade over recent years, okay? But it's not just the, the downwave thermal radiation or long wave, it's the short wave. And it's not from the changes in the sun because they're a magnitude of order shorter. So the top of the atmosphere uh, solar radiation or the solar constant is a certain value. And the, the, the amount of light getting to the earth is modulated greatly by these aerosols. So um, the largest variations in, um, in surface solar radiation or the short wave is being measured at various observation sites and between the 50s and 80s, it decreased at most sites. Then it partially recovered uh, with a brightening after the 80s. So this is what we've been seeing. Um, and uh, so this is also reflected in the diurnal temperature range, daily temperature range. Um, there's lots of other evidence that supports this. Um, so. The, these variations are not caused by the sun, but by variations in the transparency of the atmosphere to solar radiation. Now, it's not due to the radiative gases, that they, those aren't uh, changing significant enough to affect the, the shortwave radiation. Most of the shortwave gets through those because they're not radiate, they're, they're active in the infrared, not in the visible. Um, so it's aerosols and clouds, basically. On longer time scales, aerosols dominate. On shorter, decadal to sub-decadal, the clouds dominate. Um, so it's mostly the influence of aerosols. Um, they, also, there's an interaction between clouds and aerosols. They're not independent. And this can amplify or dampen the surf, uh, surface solar radiation trends in pristine and polluted areas. So it amplified, the effect is amplified um, in pristine areas like over the ocean. Uh, we have pristine area, you put some uh, aerosol particles, it has huge effects on, on, damp, on um, reducing surface solar radiation, whereas in polluted areas, it can dampen the effect. So we don't have a lot of direct measurements over the oceans. We get satellite measurements and stuff, and we're getting some buoy measurements, but um, so, so anyway, all of these factors seem to point out, and in combined with the radiative forcing from the IPCC, that, um, that you know, we're looking at um, that the global dimming effect is not 
you know, it's not an enormous uh, effect. 